Motion. Second. I can make a motion. I'm asking you to make a motion. Who's first? Call the time. Thank you. Thank you. First, I want the agenda tonight is report on the bond proposition, Dr. Short. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying that this process actually started back in January 2014. And at that point, we started a community uh, bond group. And the lucky person to get voted chairperson uh, of that bond committee is Mr. Jamie Ruzica, who I'd like to recognize in the audience. And uh, Jamie, if you'd like to share anything. Sure. Uh, I guess we can say how lucky that role is. But, uh, <laughs> I came at it from a couple of different ways. Those of you that don't know me, um, I'm married to Sable, so I'm a great grandkids will be officially from Sable, I think. But I married Sable Girl, so that, that brought me here. But once we got into town, we got very immersed. I have recently been president of Sable Rotary, uh, coach coach on the Sable Marcy course in Boston specifically. But I also, and I think this was really the reason why I was asked to take on this role, I managed a couple hundred million dollars worth of municipal bonds. Exactly the kind of bonds that we're trying to raise right here. So as an old history major, I kind of, you know, you don't take one source, you take a whole bunch of sources. So the way we ran this committee was we tried to get as many people from the community as we possibly could, from as many different walks of life as we possibly could. Pro, against, what we need, what we don't. And then we just spent the better portion of, I'd say, four or five meetings over five or six months prioritizing that list. And then having the architects and the people fly out exactly how much everything costs. And then we prioritized that list and then passed it on to the board. Tonight we'll hear uh, what you think and why. So it was a lovely process. There was a lot of uh, certainly heated debate on many topics. But I think everybody had a chance that was in the room to say what they thought. And hopefully, uh, we'll see how everybody feels. Thank you very much. It was an honor, sir. Thank you for taking your time. And uh, also, remember uh, Mr. Suko was on the committee to the time, I think, other than some of the administrators that was it. That's here tonight. And some board members. Right now, I'd like to. To uh, Mr. Belmonte to do his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Schauder, and I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, this is the presentation for the community uh, community forum for our proposed bond issue that we will be presenting to the community with the budget in in May. And staying with the theme of the process, just to expand on that uh, slightly, uh, prior to the um, bond committee convening in January 2004, uh, 2014, uh, there was a lot of background work that was done. We worked, district administrators, staff worked extensively with our architects, with our engineers, to develop a facilities needs list and we could determine what the needs were of the district on a long-term basis. Um, at the end of that process, we put together a facility needs assessment listing that totaled $36.5 million. And it was from this process forward that the bond committee was convened in January of 2014. Um, and as Jamie indicated, it comprised stakeholders from all across the district. And they met for a good part of, of six months and went through a very comprehensive review and analysis of what was in that report, item by item. Um, part of that committee was, was the district's architects and engineers and also gave a thorough review and explanation of some of the items that were included on the district's needs assessment as well as the condition of most of those items. So back in January and July of 2014, they did present their recommendations to the board. And from the $36 million from the total assessment, uh, they prioritized and came up with priority one and two and unrated priorities, which equaled about 24 
$1.1 million. From that process on, then the Board of Education took over. They took all that information. They started filtering through it. We've had uh, meetings with our architect and engineer that presented every single item that was in that facilities report for the board's review at various meetings. So that brings us where we are today with a proposed bond referendum that's $19.2 million that will be presented with the budget on May 19th to the voters. <clears throat> when we went through this process and we looked at the items that we had in the infrastructure report, uh, generally you can classify most of the items, if not all of the items, into one of these categories. They're either energy efficiency items, it's maintenance of facilities, it's health and safety items, it's ADA compliant issues, and it's out and out enhancements. It's interesting to note that when we talk about this, I just want to take a minute and just to give you an indication of um, how old our buildings are. And if we look at the high school, the high school was originally built in 1957. So that makes it 58 years old. And that's not to say that over the years we put some extensions on that were much earlier and we made renovations over the years as well. The middle school was originally built in 1970. That makes that building 45 years old. When we look at Lincoln Avenue, it was built in 1966, 49 years old. When we look at Cherry Avenue, built in 1957, the building is 58 years old. Sunrise Drive, built in 1960, the building is 55 years old. And when we look at the Green Avenue facility that's rented to East and Suffolk Boses, that building was built in 1938, and it's 77 years old. And when you look at this building, this building, believe it or not, was built in 1926 and is currently 89 years old. And for the most part, when you look at our facilities, you would see that they're in pretty good shape because the board and the community has uh, really taken care of our facilities over the years. And that's what we're proposing to continue doing with this bond referendum. I'd like to summarize what some of the items are in this bond referendum, and I'm not going to go through every single item, but I will inform everyone that the facility needs assessment that I talked about is online. It's a packet that looks like this. It's broken down by building. It has every single item that we're proposing in the bond referendum. It has one column that gives you the total uh, facility assessments that total the $36 million, and then it gives you the column next to it with the board adopted recommendations for the $19.2 million. So if you'd like uh, to see the detail, it is available online. But starting out with that, one of the most priority items, the highest priority item that we have is the middle school replacement. Um, this is a very, very large project. Uh, the middle school roof is over 125,000 square feet, and to those of you that are uh, familiar with that building, we've had significant issues with the roof, especially over this past winter. Uh, we had some significant leaks, and that roof has seriously passed its useful life. Um, we have temporary repairs uh, on the roof at this particular point, and this total, uh, the total cost of this replacement is about three and a half million dollars. And uh, that roof currently has two roofs on it, and that's why the cost is, you know, a little bit high, because we're going to have to go down to the decking, and the both roofs are going to have to come off. It's a very large project. It's going to be a very difficult project to coordinate, um, either during the summer or after school and at, and at various points in time. But nonetheless, it's a project that must be done. The replacement of boilers throughout the districts, specifically at the high school at Lincoln Avenue and the administration building. Uh, those are the boilers that are in the, uh, the worst condition, and we're recommending replacing those. Uh, it carries an estimated cost of about $2.6 million. Um, most of the buildings you'll see a little bit later, I'll show you some pictures. The 
high school has three boilers, your elementary schools have two boilers, and the administration building has one boiler. And when you see the size of these buildings, these boilers, they're not like your typical boilers that you see in your home. Um, the next item, we're recommending a dual fuel generator at the IMC Technology Building. That's the, uh, the one-story building that's directly across the way. That's where we house our technology department, and we house a lot of our technology infrastructure. It would really serve the district well that in certain situations, with the loss of power, that we're able to keep uh, that particular facility up and running. We currently have generators at our administration building, as well as the high school that we're able to keep the buildings running. Uh, we also, it, we should mention that we are a uh, Red Cross facility, so in the case of an emergency, um, the communities and the Red Cross called on us, our buildings would be, uh, be able to be used for the community as well. The High School Library Meteor Center. This is, uh, this is another opportunity to upgrade the high school library consistent and equal to the uh, meteor centers that we did at the elementary school several years ago. We're also recommending air conditioning in the third floor of this building, as well as the high school auditorium and the cafeterias at Lincoln and Cherry Avenue. And uh, the reason why we don't have Sunrise Drive in there is that when we put the extension on the Sunrise Drive, we added the cafeteria to Sunrise Drive, that particular facility already has air conditioning. Uh, in it. Uh, relative to this building, uh, we're happy to say that we are in discussion with several organizations to rent the third floor of this building. Um, currently, Suffolk Community College rents the first floor and the second floor, and uh, they have expressed an interest in renting the third floor as well. So it's our hope that uh, any cost considerate, considerate with the air conditioning at the third floor to go junior high is going to be offset with rental income as well as uh, building aid. So uh, not a bad return on investment, if you will. Lincoln Avenue, the upgrade of the public address system throughout the building. Um, this is another uh, piece of our building that's just, it's, it's aged, it's antiquated, and it's just the equipment is starting to fail. And these are some of the things that just need to be upgraded. <coughs> The same with the middle school upgraded the auditorium wiring and lighting and sound system for our musical productions. Um, and then we have our middle school pool infrastructure and ventilation system. We have a very antiquated ventilation system and we need to really look at uh, improving that for the pool facility. Uh, an upgrade of our electrical service at Sunrise Drive Elementary School. Uh, this is something when we put the last extension on um, that we really were at full capacity uh, with our electrical service. So what we're recommending here is to upgrade that where it's, um, where it's more usable and we have room for expansion. Uh, the bus loop in front of the high school. Those of you that are familiar with that building, um, there's always, uh, we always have traffic issues, we always have safety issues, we always have situations where we have buses in the bus loops with cars in the bus loop. Uh, which is something that's not permitted by law when buses are loading and unloading students. So this is something that we have all that space in the front that we, uh, we would like to put a bus loop in and in with that bus loop we also have the availability to put a few more parking spaces. Uh, ADA upgrades, anytime you do a project like this we always make sure that it's ADA compliant, Americans with Disabilities Act, and we'll be looking at our nurse's office, specifically in two areas, and that would be in the high school and in Lincoln Avenue. Additional parking at Lincoln Avenue Elementary School. Um, right now, based on the staffing levels that we have there, there's not sufficient parking. We do not have enough parking spaces. But fortunately for us, we have an area in the northwest corner that's wooded, and part of the bond referendum, we would propose to expand that parking lot and add an additional 21 parking spaces. Um, there's a small provision in the bond for playgrounds at each of our elementary schools, Sunrise, Lincoln, and Cherry, and it's basically a $30,000 provision to keep up with some of the uh, 
ADA compliant issues and to continually uh, provide places where our students can uh, go out during the day and exercise and get their uh, recreation. Uh, one of the other big items that we'll talk about a little bit more in depth is the turf field, the synthetic turf field with lights and bathrooms at the Depot Road and Greeley Avenue property. And what we're looking for here is a complete sports complex, a home and visitor grandstands, concession stands with restrooms. The field will have the proper drainage, and we'll talk a little bit more, more about that later. Uh, another item that's in the bond is upgrade of kitchen equipment. And this is something, again, uh, when you recognize the age of our building, a lot of the items that are in our kitchen are original to the building. We've been maintaining and we've been maintaining and it's getting to a point where as these items break down, it's becoming more and more difficult to get, get parts for. Um, we looked at our district-wide paving and updating our storm drains. That's something that's a, that's a, that's a maintenance issue that must be done on a district-wide basis, um, especially with the winters that we've been having. With all the dirt over a period of time, your storm drains, your drainage, it fills up with sand. These things have to be these things have to be opened up. They have to be cleaned up, and cleaned out, and ensure that the proper drainage is in place. And this will all also allow us putting in additional drainage where needed throughout the district. We experienced some flooding at the middle school. We experienced some flooding in the parking lots at Cherry Avenue. So looking at this very carefully which would allow us to do that district-wide. Um, upgrade security intrusion alarm systems. These are your uh, security systems, if you will, that are in the building. Again, these are, we have aging systems, and what happens when we go to add additional panels, additional <coughs> key pads, when things break down, it's unfortunate, but we're having a real difficult time in getting these items repaired. Um, so one of the things that we have to look at is upgrading the technology because a lot of the technology um, that, that we have is basically obsolete. And when you look at our emergency lighting and fire alarm system, uh, we run into the same issues. The technology is moving so fast that as these systems break down, companies are really not maintaining the things that we have. And it really behooves us to, um, to upgrade these particular items within the building. So that was basically a, um, a, you know, a pretty hefty summary of what was in, uh, what's in the 19.2 million. There's a lot of other items, and as I mentioned, um, if you go to the facilities assessment report, you're able to see all of the detail. Uh, the boilers, uh, that's a very, that's a very uh, important item for us as well. Uh, this is a listing of our schedule of boilers. You can see that they run in ages from 11 years old to 46 years old. And uh, one thing that I want to point out, we do have Cherry Avenue highlighted, but um, what happened earlier in the year is we had a boiler failure at Cherry Avenue where one of our boilers ruptured. And we have two boilers at Cherry. And the boiler failed, it was non-repairable and the board declared a emergency, and we had the boiler, boilers replaced. Um, we were running that building on one boiler, which you're able to do. The downside is, and we would really we rolled the dice, because if that second boiler had gone down, we would not be able to have kids in that building. We would have had two options. We would have had to bring temporary heat into the building, or we would have had to re relocate the classes at Cherry Avenue. So when you talk about your aging facilities and you talk about these type of infrastructure items, extremely, extremely important to recognize and to maintain these items. I've always said a picture's worth a thousand words. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do less talking now and I should just show you um, what some of the things are that I've been talking about. These are the boilers at the high school. Uh, you can see that there's three boilers. And um, you can see how complex the boiler rooms are. You know, so when you, when you embark on a project of this nature, the real challenge is breaking these things down, cutting them up, getting them out of the building, 
and then getting new boilers into the building. So when you realize that why a single boiler costs around $450,000 to $500,000 to replace, I think a picture is worth a thousand words. Middle school roof. The one thing that will shorten the life of a roof is standing water. Okay, and you can see by this picture um, that we have at the middle school, uh, one of the significant issues is standing the water. You can see that the drains are um, away from where the water ponds. And um, in replacement of the roof, I'm happy to say that the systems have changed. What they do now is once this roof comes off to the deck, they use built-up insulation. And the built-up insulation is tapered to the drains. So the whole idea is the drains are placed in the lower part of the installation and it's supposed to avoid water ponding on the roofs. So in the proposal, uh, when we replace this roof, we will be doing it correctly. Uh, this is another shot of the high school. In the top picture, you can see the standing water in the corner. And the bottom picture is a picture of the skylight that's in the commons area. So when you walk into the middle school, you see that beautiful open skylight in the middle. This is a shot from the roof. And if you were able to look closely on all the metal straps and the seams around the side, you'll see that there's a lot of caulking on there. You'll see that there's a lot of patching. You'll see that the glass is yellow. So part of the roof replacement, we will also be replacing the skylights. This is the dehumidification system for the pool. Um, this is one of the units that we talked about replacing and upgrading. Uh, the unit is obsolete. Um, tremendous amount of downtime, uh, breakdowns, and very costly to keep running. Um, it's old technology, so one of the things we're looking at is to upgrade this piece as well. Um, it's difficult to see, but this is a, just a section of the roof. All these little Well, it doesn't work this far. I had a point there. All those little patches. Oh, here goes. Okay. Those are all patches. And if you look closely, they're, you know, that's the condition of the middle school roof. And that's what we've been dealing with to keep the roof together. Um, old Junior High School, Turf Field. Um, this is a shot, a rendering that the architects and engineers put together. Uh, this is what we are proposing. Um, in addition to this, you'll see that you have home and visitor grandstands on both sides. What we are looking at is possible additional parking, okay, to create some additional parking spaces, um, concession stands, bathrooms, as I mentioned. So this would be a full uh, sports complex. Just to talk about parking, because I know that parking has always been a concern. Um, we did a little bit of a, a study, and we looked at the parking spaces at the admin building, at the old junior high, at the Green Avenue, and also at the public parking at the train station that's right across from this building. And with what we have available now for use for this particular field, it would be about 420 parking spaces and about 20 of those parking spaces will be handicapped spaces. So um, if we were to go forward with this particular project, again, we would be looking to expand that, being that the fields would mostly be used in the afternoon, um, it would make most of our parking areas available uh, for people that had activities uh, on the field. Okay, this is a terrible picture. Um, this is this is one of our steam traps, water pumps, part of the boiler systems, and these are the things that we've been uh, maintaining and we've been keeping going. When you walk into our buildings and you see the classrooms and you see the hallway and you see the outside, um, they're kept in very very good condition. They look good, but these are the type of things that are behind the scenes that keep the building operating. And it's, and it's des desperately in need of upgrade and repair. Again, uh, 
This is one of the older boilers at Lincoln Avenue School. Uh, this boiler is 46 years old. Still going, we're keeping it alive, okay? And uh, you know, we hope with this bond referendum we'll be able to upgrade those boilers. Sunrise Drive Elementary School, I talked about the electrical upgrade. Uh, this is a typical, uh, what they call electrical switching here uh, that's antiquated and obsolete. Uh, we have absolutely no more room in this particular um, panel in this switch. And with the, with the amount of technology that you enter into the buildings, with the need for additional electricity, with the need for additional power, um, it's one thing, this is, again, this is one of their priority items. This is something that must be done. And we're proposing uh, increasing this from a, right now it's 1,200 amp system, and we're looking to go up to a 2,000 amp system uh, to give us a little bit of capacity and some better efficiencies at Sunrise Drive. Uh, Sunrise Drive boiler, we're not gonna be replacing the boilers at Sunrise Drive, but we wanna replace the burners. Um, all of our schools have what we call dual fire burners. They burn, they work on um, diesel fuel as well as natural gas. Most of the time, they run on natural gas, unless the temperature gets really cold. The natural gas reduces the carbon footprint and it's much more effective and efficient uh, fuel to burn. Uh, very rarely do we uh, run on fuel oil. But we do have fuel oil tanks in case the gas system goes down, it's like a redundant system. Again, Sunrise Drive, some of our steam traps, and some of our pumps. Administration building, this is the one boiler that's in the administration building. Uh, in the proposed bond, we're looking to remove this boiler and put two boilers in its place. Uh, you can see by the face of it, the age. Again, this is a dual-fired uh, boiler. And again, this boiler is, administration building is 45 years old. This is the original boiler to the building. So that ends the picture show. And uh, the next thing that I thought might be helpful is during this lengthy budget process that really started for us in 2013, bond committee back in 2014, we've had many questions along the way. What if this, what if that? So FAQ frequently asks questions. And I thought it would be helpful just to summarize some of the salient points. Um, we did mail a bond bulletin home to the community. It has a few more Q&As in them and a lot of information. And as we gather additional questions, we will be posting them a F FAQ log or um, journal on the website that will list these questions. So as we get the questions, we'll be providing the answers online so people will be able to um, have answers to the questions. So the first question that we, we received is what happens if the cumulative cost of all the planned bond projects exceeds the voter approved bond amount? So what they're saying here is we went through a lot of projects. We're asking for $19.2 million. What happens as we're going down through these, this, the list if we don't have enough money to do the projects? Well, it's simple. You backtrack. The projects are done in phases. And what, what normally happens we get to a point that once a project is awarded, we know what the costs are. And we keep track of that cumulative cost. And if we know that we're in a situation that a project has come overbid, we have basically two avenues of resolution. The first avenue of resolution is we can reduce the scope of the project, maybe not do as much, um, do half, do two thirds, or we can not continue with that project. It's just cost prohibitive. But I'm happy to, to report that um, if the community approves this, this is this will be my third bond issue here at Sable. Um, the first two bond issues that we completed together, the $30.5 million and the $13.4 million, all the work that the district set forth to do was done in addition to more work that was beyond. And the projects came in under budget. So, you know, we have a pretty good track record in managing these things. 
And um, we're confident that we can do the same if the committee uh, gave us the approval to move forward. The next question uh, that we'd like to address, how much of the $19.2 million bond will increase our existing debt service to the budget? Everybody thinks about bond, and right away they think the taxes are going up and my budget's, my budget's going up. In this particular case, that's not the case because we've planned and we have over $2 million of debt that's retiring in the 2016-17 school year. The idea of doing this now and planning the way we have is to offset some of that decrease with a new bond, okay? But keep it under our current debt service levels. And basically what that will do is even with this new bond that we are suggesting that the community support, it will still reduce our debt service expense by over $300,000. And it might be a little difficult to understand what I just said, but I'm going to show you a slide later on that hopefully it will tie it together and it will become clearer. But to answer the question, this new bond will not increase our debt service. Our debt service will decrease. This is another great question. If we don't bond, will our school taxes go down? The answer is unequivocally no. The outstanding debt service decreases by over $2 million in the 16-17 school years. The taxpayers will not see a $2 million savings. Why? Because we still have to fund many of those high-cost capital projects that we just looked at. The middle school roof, the boiler, the other infrastructure upgrades. These are things that have to be done. If you have to do them, you have to figure out a way to pay for them. They can, you either pay for them one or two ways. You pay for them with a bond, or you pay for them through a capital project where the entire fiscal burden is put on the taxpayers in one year. Okay? And I guess the best way to show that, I put together a simple example. I don't know how simple, but for me it's simple. On the left, we have, let's just take the roof, and we'll say the roof was a $3 million cost. We bond that project over 15 years, and we amortize that out. The annual debt service is about $320,000 a year just for that project. The net cost on the tax rate is about $102,000. Why? The difference is, is that we get 68% building aid. Okay? So if we take that net cost on the tax rate, and break it out over home assessed at $40,000, the impact on the tax rate is 0.11% on the tax rate, or $14 a year. Okay? Very, very simple example. You move over and you say, okay, let's now fund that. We don't want to do a bond. We want to put that into the budget. Okay, we can put it into the budget. What happens? We take that $3.5 million, we add it to the budget and the capital project line, okay? The building aid on the project is still paid over the life of the project. So what happens in the budget, you're, the taxpayers are funding $3.5 million. The building aid is paid out over 15 years. So you got all your costs up front that you're paying for. Could you do it that way? Sure you can. Is it fiscally responsible? No, it's, it's expensive. What that would impact the tax rate, that would increase the tax rate 6.16% of $462 a year, okay? And that's your upfront. So that's just an, one example if you isolate one of those items. Extrapolating that, taking that out, out further, without a bond, think about the boilers and think about the other items putting them into the budget. Um, it would have a tremendous impact on the tax rate. Is that a good example or not understandable? No? Yes. Yes? Thank you. Okay. Great. One more FAQ. Why is the district considering a turf field at this time? Um, during the bond process, we've had a lot of discussions about turf field. And I think to summarize, the number one reason is safety. Uh, the excessive use of the depot field by our sports team 
causes significant damage to the playing fields. We're just with the amount of use it gets, with the weather conditions, you're just not able to keep grass in the goal areas and, and keep that field in a good working condition. It's just what it is and it's what it's been. Um, when you have that type of condition, <coughs> you open yourself up for additional student injuries and things of that nature. In addition to the safety concerns, the turf fields allows for fewer cancellations of scheduled practices and games caused by inclement weather. Uh, those of you that are familiar with the sporting schedules, how many times have a game has been canceled because it's rained all day? In the afternoon, it may have stopped, can't use the field, field's underwater. It's a, it's a mud hole, okay? The same thing with practices. With a turf field, you have a drainage system that's under the field. This, the, the field drains, okay? So the question of if it's raining all day and it stops at two o'clock in the afternoon and the game is at four, shouldn't be an issue, okay? The game goes on, the practice goes on. Uh, it allows more of our scholastic teams to utilize the field. Uh, right now, because of, the, uh, because of the weather conditions, because of the number of teams, because of the number of factors, um, fields are at a premium. Um, that field is, complete, is always used for our high school teams, okay? And um, by having a turf field there, we'll be able to open it up to other sports. Um, girls field hockey, um, girls team, in addition to opening it up on weekends and after hours for our community youth athletic organizations to use as well. So, you know, when you look at the pluses for a turf field, there are, there are definitely many. Another great question. There was a lot of discussion and debate that with the addition of a turf field and a bond, there's been many safety concerns raised as to the use of rubber infill. And the number one question that came out of those discussions, what has the board done to address these safety concerns? Okay. The board has looked at all of these studies, and there were many. I didn't even count them, but I don't know, probably 20, 30, if not more. Um, and at this juncture, all the professionals, including the state education department, as he did, have deemed this, deemed this issue to be inconclusive. However, just because it's incon inconclusive, it doesn't mean that we didn't take it seriously. So what the board has done, to their credit, is they had approved that if we're going to go forward with a turf field, we do not want to use infill rubber. We want to use organic infill. And what is organic infill? Organic infill is a product of pork, rice husk, and coconut fiber. It's slightly more costly than infill rubber, but it takes the safety question out of the mix. Sticking with the theme of the turf field. A lot of people were asking, why do we have to do the turf field? Why is it in the bond? What percentage of dollar value is a turf field within the bond? If you looked at the whole bond of 19.2 million, the turf field, as I said, was 2.6. That represents 13.5% of the overall bond. The rest of the items are the things that we talked about as far as the boilers and the infrastructure upgrades. The next question that really ties into this, if the cost of the turf field were removed from the bond, what is the change in cost to each household and how much would, how, and how would that amount affect the tax rate? Okay, considering it's a 15 year bond, if we were just to pull this out, how much would the, the cost of the bond go down? Well, it would go down, by about 0.08%, 24 cents on the tax rate, $10 per year. Very small cost to spread out over a period of 15 years. Okay? <laughs> Nonetheless, still a cost. <laughs> Just bring in the facts, brother. <laughs> Okay, so now that we've talked about what's in the bond, we looked at some pictures, we answered some FAQs about what this is all about, 
I'd like to just talk about some of the financing and what makes this a window of opportunity. Why consider a bond? Uh, first of all, as you probably demise from this conversation, that the bond issue allows for the repayment of debt over time. This is no different when you purchase a car and you finance it for five years, six years. When you purchase a home and you finance it for 20 years, 25 years, 30 years. It spreads your cost over time. It spreads your cost. And yes, there is an interest cost, but that too is aidable for the district. And by using a bond issue, we talk about when the building aid is paid by the state to the district. Building aid is paid over the life of the project. So if we do a bond and it's 15 years, and in general, the debt cert, the capital um, state aid is paid, the building aid is paid over a period of 13 years. So you're paying principal and interest, and you're getting revenue on the other side of the budget. The taxpayer is paying a very small piece of that. Okay? Again, we get back 68 cents on every approved dollar. And there are things in the, I have approved, highlighted, there are things in the bond that are not aidable. So I don't want everybody, anybody walking away from this meeting thinking that $19.2 million is going to be aidable. It's usually not. There's things like when you do the administrative boilers, administrative items, okay, when you get into areas like asbestos abatement, those things are not aidable. So the State Education Department takes that cost out of the project and it doesn't provide building aid. But nonetheless, we still get probably about 80 to 85 percent aid on our total bond cost. We have aggressively managed the bonds over the last 14 years to minimize the impact of the tax rate. And you'll see that with a chart that I'm about to show. Okay, and recently we just finished the second refinancing of prior year bonds. And this was an opportunity that when we sell bonds, we put a call provision in those bonds. And what that call provision allows us to do is that if the interest rates drop, we can refinance those bonds. So probably about a year and a half ago, we did our first refi on a 2002 issue that we, um, that we had in place. And we saved over $800,000 or close to $800,000 in interest over a period of nine years. In other words, we refinanced the remaining debt, the same number of years, and we brought down the district's outlay by over $800,000. Again, that's a budgetary savings. Your costs are going down. We just completed the second phase of the 2005 borrowing. It's a very small piece, but we were very happy to report that we saved over $100,000 on that refinancing. So those are the things that we do internally to manage the the debt and to manage the debt service that constantly bring the cost down. What's our Moody's rating here? Excuse me? What's our Moody's rating? Uh, Moody's rating is a double A2. And um, I guess the reason why Dr. Chardon says that, we discussed this at the last board meeting. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with our underwriters and Moody's for about three hours in reviewing and presenting the district's finances. And um, even though we had a $2.4 million deficit last year, operating deficit, um, based on the fiscal strength of the school district, they upheld our bond rating at a, uh, at a double A2, which was incredible for stable <coughs> schools. Why that is so important is because when you go out and sell bonds, the fiscal stability of the school district is key. And I know Jamie is, <laughs> Jamie's smiling back there, he knows exactly what I'm talking about. To give you an example, um, when we first embarked on the estimate to refinance the 2005 bonds, we had estimates based on interest rates of about $72,000 that we were going to save. And because of our bond rating and the continuation of our bond rating, we were able to save over $100,000. So it's things like that, $30,000 doesn't sound like a lot, but when you add it on top of the already $800,000 and things like that, it does bring our costs down. And usually what happens when those costs come down, those are non-instructional support costs, okay? Those are the things that get, those savings usually get swallowed up to support the instructional program, to keep our instructional program going. And 
And uh, that's one of the things that we prided ourselves over the last couple of years as well. So I mentioned that this is a window of opportunity. The window of opportunity is this. Um, we are in the 15, 16 year, we are right here. And what this line represents is our current debt service at this point. We talked about a $2 million drop off in the 16, 17 school year. That's right here. In 16, 17, our debt service goes down to this level. The window of opportunity is right in here. When you, need, when you have facility infrastructure needs and you're looking for a way to finance it, that doesn't increase, oh boy, okay, sorry about that. That doesn't increase above your current level of debt, your current amount that's in the budget, okay? It's a win-win for the community. And I know a lot of people might not like that, but it is, it's a win-win. Why? Because when you look at this, this middle line, is the 19.2 million. When you lay that over at a projected 4.25% interest rate, you'll see that our debt service does not raise above our current level. So we have a savings. Right here is the savings. We'll save over $300,000 in debt service where our costs will go down and we'll be able to move forward with all of the items that we talked about this evening. Okay. That's your window of opportunity. This piece up in here is the savings that you see through the life of the bond. As the bond matures, your costs go down. I'm going to present two, what I call two approaches. A top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. So we can be as transparent as possible because some people, when they look at this, they have a hard time seeing that it's a reduction of cost. And people say, well, you're still increasing the debt. Okay, so I'm going to present both sides for the community. I'm trying to be neutral. As, as we indicated, this is not working. Okay. okay, there it goes. Okay, as we indicated, this is the 15, 16 school year. And this is the savings, okay? So again, this just reinforces what I said earlier. When we go from 1516 to 1617, this is our current debt level, debt, debt level that's in the budget. This is where we would be if we were to float a new bond. The savings for the debt service would be approximately a $300,000 reduction. Not an increase, a reduction. Why? It's simple. In 1516, let's say we, bu we budgeted $1,000 for debt service. And 1617 comes, even with a new bond, we only have to budget $750. Okay, we had 1,000, we're budgeting 750. Okay, your expenses are going down. Okay, because it's coming off your prior year expenditure level. That's the top-down approach. Okay, the bottom-up bottom approach is if you didn't do this, your debt would be down here. But you're adding this new debt. So what is the cost between these two lines? Okay? That's simple. Looking at the debt in isolation, and again, this is only looking at the debt in isolation with no other variables that happen within the budget. It's a $19.2 million bond. There's your amortized cost at 4.25% at over 15 years. This is what the bond cost would be. Um, going back to what I said earlier, that all of your costs are not 100% aidable. So let's, let's bring that down and say that 85% of your cost will be aidable. So we come up with, a, we take the bond cost, we come up with 85% value. It's aidable at a 68% rate. This is the cost of the taxpayer. Okay, this is what we're adding to the budget on a bottom-up approach. What is that differential costing me in dollars? Okay, the average annual cost over 15 years, $741. What's the estimated cost? $96 a year, $8 a month. Okay, so again, you have the top-down approach where your expenses are going down. 
And we also know what the cost of the bond and the differential is from if, if we let the bonds expire, what would be the cost of the new bond? So we have it both ways. And again, these estimates are based on the 1516 um, tax base. So that's all I have for you. Hopefully you found it informative. And um, I didn't take too much time. So I guess now we would open it up to questions. And hmm. Will we open up to Usually for a public school district, the AA2 is normally the highest rating that they go. I mean, it is possible to go for a AA1, but there has to be a lot of, uh, a lot, many more things done to achieve that. Is that very common in districts? Or Excuse me? Do most districts have that rating? Uh, no, no. There's a few districts, but I wouldn't say that that's the, that's the standard. Um, you know, Moody's and their, and their credit rating, especially since, 19, since 2008 with the fall of the financial markets, um, they really take a, a, a really stringent look at the district's finances. <laughs> Not only the current finances, but the future finances. They want to see that the district has a plan. They want to see what the district's reserve, what their strategies are going forward, what the budget strategies are. Um, you know, these are all the things that I had the uh, benefit of talking to them about for about three hours. Stimulating. <laughs> John, I have a question. Um, actually, first I'd like to thank Jamie for sound the ship through the uh, bond committee process. You did an excellent job. And, uh, I know at times it wasn't easy, but thanks for your, uh, your commitment. Um, first, I just wanted to just get, if you could clarify, John. What you said is in, in our last two bond issues, we were able to come in basically under budget with increased scope on both, both bond issues? Yes, the first bond issue, the $30.5 million, we were able to, uh, we finished all the projects, and um, most of the projects that came in, we were taking credits back to the board for approval uh, for monies that we were saving from managing the jobs. Um, and as a result, we were able to build the Sunrise Drive cafeteria, which was an unplanned project. It was on our planning screen, but it was not part of that bond referendum. So we were able to do that. And the last bond issue, 13.4, much smaller, um, we were able to do a significant piece of the girls' bathrooms that we're doing now at Green Avenue. Excellent. So I'd like the community to keep that in mind that even though we bond a certain amount, it does not have to be spent. And if we come in under budget, we can use those additional funds, if the board approves, for additional projects if need be. Now that being said, uh, we currently have an energy performance contract with the district, which at no upfront cost to the district, helps us to offset our energy costs. Again, at no cost to the district, and I'd like to thank John for, for seeing that process through. When I became involved in, in the bond committee process, um, I felt that there were certain areas where maybe we could cover some of the costs in the bond with maybe an energy performance contract enhancement. So John and I had a couple conversations about this, and I'd like to thank Dr. Shartner and John for appointing me chairman of the energy performance contract phase two committee. And on this committee, what we're exploring is can we do solar, maybe do cogeneration, outdoor lighting? Can we find ways to offset some of the energy demand and find ways to, to pull projects out of the bond, possibly, to lower the amount of money we can spend? So the question I want to ask you, John, is if we were to move forward with this phase two energy performance contract, is it possible to lower the amount of take some of the projects out of the bond, per se. Um, yes, I mean, that's something that we still have to flush out. I mean, I am, you know, I am an advocate and proponent of saving money and not having to spend it if you don't have to. And just for, um, just for the community's understanding what an energy performance contract is and how it works, is that um, it's a, 
It's a contract that's approved by the State Education Department that guarantees a certain return based on energy savings. And what that means is, is that we fund a significant amount of projects and it ends up being a zero cost to the taxpayer because those savings are guaranteed by contract for every year of that debt service. So for instance, in one year, let's say they guarantee us a million dollars in savings. Let's say our principal and interest payments are a million dollars. Let's say when we do the analysis, guess what? We didn't save a million dollars. They were wrong on their projections. The technology they used was not correct. Well, whatever that shortfall is, they have to pay the district and make the district whole. So it's a contractual obligation, okay? So it's a no cost uh, element to, to doing those type of projects. And we completed about $7.2 million worth of work throughout the district um, that consisted of changing lighting, ballast, uh, building management systems that controlled our heat and motions on our uh, lights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a lot of things that we've already uh, incorporated. As we look at putting a new roof on the middle school, there are our opportunities to look at solar. Again, through an energy performance contract, no impact to the taxpayer because it's guaranteed, guaranteed cost savings, okay? Um, in areas of the boilers, the boilers, sometimes you might get the payback is a little bit long for an energy performance contract. You gotta have a savings within 18 years. Uh, but to, to answer Carl's question, yes. There are things in this bond issue that we may be able to piggyback on or pull out, if you will, that may be able to achieve additional savings as well. Who is the energy performance contract with? require that incentive that they build? Well, what happens is it's a process that we go through. Um, we deal with an engineering firm that puts out an RFP to different ESCOs, they call them. And the last ESCO we had was Johnson Controls. And we were extremely, extremely satisfied. Um, we finished $7.2 million of work in probably a year and a half. And you didn't even know that these people were here. I mean, and the quality of the work was phenomenal. We were very, very satisfied. They came in, they did it, they were professionals, and um, it's a good story. Yeah, call, I have a question, I have a question for you. Uh, so some of that co-generation type of We, we discussed, you know, the option would be probably most likely the middle school because you could use the waste heat to heat the pool, um, run, run a hot water, you know, with the heated pool and whatnot. So the co-gen would specifically be focused on that area. I have a question for you, John, as well. The generators, the pulse generators, is there any type of, uh, or we entitled any type of rebate when we shut off? Shut the electric off and use the generators from our PSEG. I think it's called the SHED program. I think yeah, we're, called. we're currently in a program with New York State with the generators that we have at uh, the administration building and the high school. And when we run these generators and we take power off the grid, um, they pay us for it. So periodically, um, we do, they call us, they do tests, we run the generators. Our generators are exercised weekly uh, to keep them going. Again, our generators run on diesel fuel and natural gas. Uh, mostly they run on natural gas. They just use a little bit of diesel fuel to lubricate the motors. But we do receive, um, we do receive compensation from the state on that as well. And those projects are also aidable. So you also get your 68% building aid on the project as well. Uh, the middle school roof and the part of the middle school roof where the pool is. Is that part of the same roof uh, yes. bond? Yes.
boilers maybe, everything else would be like a put off. There are 100 foreclosures in this town alone. Our houses are worth nothing. We're still in a recession, people have forgotten that, and you're asking for a $19 million apartment. It's insane. I am going to be talking to everybody I can in this town to vote this down. Backing off of what she said, my name is Alia Richards. Um, I've addressed this a number of times, but not the only one. Um, just to go back to um, Mr. Belmonte's page regarding uh, bonding these necessary projects versus putting them in the regular budget, and um, especially because you pointed out how irresponsible, how financially irresponsible it would be if you had to do it through the normal budget. Um, this was an FAQ that you didn't cover. I brought it up. Other community members brought it up. I, I don't remember one of the board members was on board with this. Making it a two-step bond, the necessities mm -hmm. and the what we want. And, <coughs> and then you really get to know what your community wanted. You know, the fact that that idea was kind of tossed around, I guess you didn't do it and I'm really disappointed. Thank you. Come on. give our children those same opportunities is an important, uh, was an important piece of the discussion when we discussed this. And when you have the turf fields, if you're going to open it up to your community and you're going to get additional use, um, you need to have the grandstands for the home, the home side as well as the visitor side. In order to make it a, uh, a complex, um, there's lights involved. You would have lights on the field, which means that you could use the field for additional hours beyond what we're capable of using the fields. Um, and, you know, when you take it one step further, when you have uh, events at the, uh, at the field and you have uh, public bathrooms, it's a, it's a convenience to have public bathrooms as well. So to, you know, to put a full sports complex in, if you're going to do a turf field, um, it, makes, it makes sense to do it the right way. There are districts that have decided to put turf fields in, and they decided not to go forward with the lights, okay? And then several years later, they decide to go forward with lighting. Unfortunately, the cables and the infrastructure that has to be run under the field requires a significant amount of work that they have to rip up what was done, significant increased cost to do it. So what we're suggesting, we looked at this from a practical standpoint. If you're gonna do it, put the infrastructure in, do it right where it's not going to cost you double down the road to put something else in um, because you already got a piece of it and it's not that easy to add to it. And you had mentioned about the community could use it. Is that right? Is there going to be any revenue at all? Are we going to get any money? Yes, we did, we did talk about that uh, with the lights that if the, you know, with, with this self, um, with the sports complex, it will have its own transformer. It will be needed. So if outside organizations were using it at nights or weekends, whatever costs that the districts incurred, we would be able to pass on to the organizations. That was discussed. Okay, now there's another thing here. The elementary school playground, I wasn't quite, didn't quite understand 
what this structure, because I live near Sunrise Drive and there's a lot of playground there. So what is it that we want to do on this? Well, some of those, uh, some of those structures are old. Um, some of those structures have been vandalized. Over the years, we've been taking down pieces from the elementary school. Um, our PTAs have been uh, gracious enough to support that and have been adding pieces when they can. Um, and it's just a commitment that the districts feel that we should be making to our elementary um, schools to provide for, um, you know, new playground equipment. I mean, when you look at the, when you look at the amount of money that we're suggesting here, uh, we're talking about $30,000 each school. Um, $30,000 is a significant amount of money, um, but the thing is is that when you tie it into building renovations, the site improvements like a playground become aidable. If you were just doing a site improvement without doing a building renovation, um, that's one of the things that the site improvement itself would not be aidable. So again, it's looking at the big picture, it's seeing the opportunity, and saying it makes sense if you're going to do it, and if you're going to spend thirty thousand dollars, well, you might as well get building aid on it, and you might as well tie it into the project. Now, this also on the high school auditorium air conditioning. Now, air conditioning, I think of summer. Do we use the auditorium in the summer? Um, I could say, well, we have the high school principal here, but I can honestly say that our buildings get used twelve months out of the year especially our high schools and our middle schools. We usually have summer schools in there, and especially when you look at the elementary schools, you've got to keep in mind that the elementary schools don't have auditoriums like the high school and the middle school. They use their cafeterias for a lot of their activities, their performances, their plays, their choruses, you know, and things like that. So, um, you know, again, it's looking at the big picture, how you use your facilities, and what's the best way to put in the necessary HVAC. Now you may have mentioned this, but I didn't hear everything. Now, it's, we get 68% A, is that correct, on that, this bond? That's correct, on approved capital expenditures. Okay, but now how much interest will we be paying on this bond? Well, one of the slides that I showed was basically, it's, um, we, I projected 4.25%, okay? And um, that's in, that's in the cost of the 19.2 million. That's principal and interest cost. But you don't, you don't get aid on that. Yes, you do. Well, we do get you aid. get aid on the interest. You get aid on the entire debt service. You get aid on the principal and you get aid on the interest. Okay. And they, can they change that aid rate? Thank you. The state can they change it? Is that change in the um, The state has talked about that. I have been doing this for 29 years and the building aid formula has not changed. That's something that has been very near and dear to school districts across the state and that's something that um, I think all our, our legislators are well aware of that. Excuse me? The ones that aren't in jail. Please, if, you have, if anybody does have questions, it's sometimes it's hard to okay. have a question chat and try to answer it. If you, if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll, I'll get to as many people as possible. Okay, my name is Lucy Bennett, I'm a state resident. Um, just as an aside, I grew up in a town with a school right next door, um, and it was chartered by Henry in 1940. Now that's an old school, not one that was built in 1960. That's 50 years old. It doesn't need to have the entire school practically ripped up and rebuilt. But my question is, um, is it not my understanding that we are holding many millions of dollars in a rainy day fund to fix things like when Lord's breaks in an elementary school? Why don't we have the money just to be able to take out that rainy day fund and fix it? Well, districts have the um, ability to set up what's called a capital reserve fund. Um, Sable does not have a capital reserve fund. Do we have other reserve funds? Yes, we do. And the, um, you know, I, I don't like to use the word rainy day fund, but we call it an unappropriated fund balance. And um, by law, we're allowed to maintain 4% of our current budget, and currently Sable is under that 4%. We're about at 3.5%. And we have been using that money. Um, you heard me mention earlier that 
the last school year, um, we actually had a $2.4 million operating deficit that ate into that reserve. The boiler emergency that we talked about at Cherry Avenue, that was a $200,000 unexpected hit that was not in the budget that we went to the board and the board appropriated fund balance to pay for that, okay? So we have been using that money. You need to use that money very cautiously when you look at the long-term fiscal health of the school district. I talked about Moody's, I talked about um, the district's bond rating. So, you know, we look at all of that. Our reserves over the last couple of years are being spent down. And we're getting to a point where you have to look at that very carefully. Can you tell me how much is in that fund right now? Um, Approximately. Off the top of my head, with with all reserves, I, I, I want to say around $23 million. So, yes. How much of that is assigned? Un unappropriated. Unappropriated, unappropriated is, pro is probably around $3 million. Okay, it's on a probe. The rest are all reserves that are set up for a specific purpose. And mandated for the And mandated for the state to be used for that purpose. But people have to understand, not to make this into a budget presentation, but how those reserves work is when we apply those reserves to the budget, which we do every year, it takes the burden off the taxpayer. It takes the burden off the tax rate. If we didn't have those reserves to apply, those additional funds would be on top of the tax rate. For instance, the year before last, we took $6 million from reserve and we used it to fund the budget. And we used $6 million from our savings, if you will, to fund reoccurring ex expenses. For the 15-16 budget, we're recommending using $4 million. So we're spending those reserves now. From a fiscal standpoint, as I mentioned, those monies are being used to fund recurring expenses. Those are not one-time deals. Those are program expenses, those are salaries, those are benefits, okay? So you've got to monitor that very carefully. So, and that's what we try to do with the reserve monies. Well, perhaps if, if you know that these expenses that you're taking more out each year, you need to cut back a little on what you're spending so that you're not spending up all those reserve monies. I would think that the reason that you have reserve monies is exactly for the sort of thing that we're speaking about, which is maintaining, you know, and replacing broken equipment. I think the turf field thing is just completely out of the loop, but fixing things like a flat roof, which we all know, no matter how many times you fix a flat roof design on a school, is always a disaster because there's always going to be standing water on it, and it's always going to leak. I don't care how many times you fix it, a flat roof has standing water. So, you know, I don't know to make a different design or, or to fix that somehow. Um, you're going to do the same repair over and over for such a waste of money. Well, if I could just clarify, you know, when I talked about the roof and I talked about the existing roof, there's actually two roofs on that building. They are going to be taken, taken off down to the deck. And that means that when we put back the insulation, on top of that roof, it's going to be tapered insulation. So the way that roof is going to be designed, the roof is going to be pitched towards the drain. We should not have what we have experienced in the past. First of all, the, the state ed requires the districts to do that. Um, it's the right application when you are putting on a flat roof these days. It requires tapered insulation and they put drains in the appropriate areas so you don't have those conditions. Like the drains that are on and some of the some now. Of the buildings, school buildings. Excuse me. Like, like the drains that are on the buildings now that aren't working. Again, sir, again, we want to try to get to everybody. We want to have the right type of dialogue. So when people shout out, kind of, we'll get to you if you want to have a question. We want to get to you. It was a statement. John, we got a question. Again, again, what this, this no, 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 but the mind we're trying to have the dialogue with her, you can answer up Please. Some buildings, some of the new school buildings out there now actually have pitch roofs in the houses. Is, I think there's one out, out east, I don't think what this one is. And which flat roofs are very difficult to maintain. Yes. So I'm guessing as, new, as some of the new buildings being built, you can see the old the pitch roofs that would be a lot more green than they are now. So just my final comments, I would like to see um, if there's any possible it to knock down, you know, 
some of this uh, bond. And I would also like to see, as this lady pointed out, um, a two-step process where you have what you absolutely need and you know what you would like and put that to the side and you know, it's a wish list for you know if you can ever possibly afford it. But this community right now, my opinion, can't afford a lot of things that are on this. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. Gentlemen, are you here? And Ken, um, just a, one or two questions. A lot of discussion obviously is against the bond, the cost of the bond. But I was wondering with all the studies, and thank you for everybody who participated in that, but if anybody looked at the operating costs, what's going to affect us on the other side? Forget the aid, forget the bond. And now we have a sports complex, we have a turf field, there's maintenance involved. We're not sprinkling some seed out there every year trying to get the grass to grow. So what impact will the 19.2 million have? The operating costs each year to our that comes back to us from the past. Good question. Mr. Well, one of the things that we looked at when we looked at the turf field, we did an analysis um, with the architects and en engineers and various studies that were out there as to the cost of maintaining a grass turf a grass field versus a turf field. Um, at the end of the day, over a period of time, the costs were very comparable. Um, because realistically, when you get into a turf field, after a period of maybe eight to ten years, you might have to replace the fabric on the, on the top of the turf. Um, you're not going to have the maintenance cost, the grounds crew cost, the labor cost, the seeding cost, the fertilizing cost, the sod form cost, and all of that things. But at the end of the day, over a 15 year period, the costs are, are about equal. Um, it just seems, seems hard. I mean, I'm not doubting you, but that concept seems difficult for me to. Uh, well, you know, it's you know, I mean, that's you know, that's the way the study came came out. When you look at when we talk about energy efficiencies and we talk about the boilers and we showed some pictures. When you think about how old that technology is, it's like you know, having an old boiler in your home. You know that it's not efficient. You know that a lot of heat is going up the flue. You know, and when you look at the when you look at the new equipment that we're putting in, the, that equipment is energy efficient. So you're not using as much fuel, um, you're saving fuel, so there are offsetting costs. The same thing with the, um, anything that would require electric or power. Um, some of the systems that we're running, they're high energy uses, and that's the reason that we did an energy performance contract. You're able to go through your building and change all the balances and reduce your energy costs by 35%. Okay, so you are incurring capital costs, but the items that you're putting in is it's generating the savings for you. And that's why the state and the contractors could offer you that type of deal where we're guaranteeing you the savings because, you know, it, it, it's, it's a no-brainer for them. Right, and, and obviously efficiencies do they help us residentially, they help them commercially. I just went through a home with a boy myself. Unfortunately, home situation is different. The payback is you know, 8, 10, 12, 15 years, and that would be my concern with the length of the bond, that some of these items, their payback is, is, is going to be depleted as a result of when their time comes, that we'll be standing here again saying they've got to be replaced again. Um, I'm just curious also, because we all know interest rates have a bigger impact on $19 million, so how firm are you, how confident are you in the 4.25% projection that you're using? I mean, if we go out there and it's 5%, 6%, I am you know, you know, I am as confident as I could be. Um, I'm hopeful that based on the market condition and the trends and the price of long-term bonds and things of that nature, that actually when we get to the point to sell bonds, I'm hoping the interest rate to be a little bit less. And if the interest rate is a little bit less, then we'll take advantage, uh, we'll take advantage of those savings. And everything we talked about here, the cost will be less. Um, in addition to that, um, we do have call provisions in the bonds, as I talked about earlier. We've already refinanced two bond referendums. We're certainly going to build that language into this bond as well. Um, to, If interest rates do drop, and we do have an opportunity to capitalize on that, we will refi the bonds. Right. And, 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 that that and that well doesn't cost. cost. Yeah, but those costs were also put into the bonds, and the savings that I talked about were inclusive of those costs, um, because it, it's all built in. Um, if we didn't have those costs, yeah, we would have saved a little bit more than 100000 but the costs were built in, so our net savings overall was 100000 on the last refi. Um, 
It's something that we manage aggressively. And then lastly, I guess, you guys, yeah, I unfortunately have to concur with other people. There's items on there that clearly, I think anyone sitting here seeing pictures would say are necessary. I, for one, it's very interesting as this lady had spoken before. I don't know why, but I did a Google search today. There are over 100 foreclosures. What she's saying is definitely true. There are people leaving the town. I mean, me personally, having a regular house on a really small piece of property, the school portion of my taxes, just the school, has exceeded $10,000. Okay. And all I can say to folks is, I think as well, it should be tiered roofs, boilers. Honestly, I mean, the trades. The estimates I see for about some of these things, I mean, no, no disrespect to the spell money. I appreciate that you guys can get things done under budget, but some things are done, you know, I can do things under budget too if the numbers are above where they should have been on the original box. So you could, you could come under budget for two reasons, through good management, which I'm sure we have, but also through bidding, which is uh, somewhat inflated. So all I can say is I think the items that were necessary should have been put forth and as other people have said, sports complex, where I'm sitting, you know what, I'm a kid who played sports, grass didn't hurt me, water didn't hurt me, a canceled game didn't hurt me. I, th I think it's way beyond it. And honestly, as she said, personally, it's keeping up with the Joneses, it's image, it's what Sable wants, maybe, I guess we'll all find out, but I really think it's, it's, it's over the top. So. But thank you. Thank you for your questions and your comments. I just want to say I am thrilled with everything that is the bonds. Um, I do represent a pretty big part of the community. I'm the Sunrise Drive PTA president. And um, I know someone had mentioned these and bonds. Turf fields, unfortunately, there are a lot of people in the community who feel it is a need, not a want, for many reasons that Mr. Belmont said tonight, and as well as so many reasons that we're at board meetings and listen to them, I guess. Um, I can say right now, I have a daughter that's on the practices they had to cancel. They were allowed to be outside. They were playing their first game against Swami Dale. They practiced for three weeks. And it was a disadvantage on the turf field. Yeah. Which is a disadvantage. Well, the board has, board has several options. 
they can go back, uh, just like the budget, they can go back, they can rework the bond, they can put the bond up for another vote. Um, okay. it, it doesn't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to be with the budget. Um, a lot of the community expressed that they would like to see the two together. And okay. um, so that's what we're doing. Okay. Um, you know, I didn't know a bond can go back up by the budget. Yeah, yeah, you can put a bond back up, you can have another bond vote. Um, they can put the same bond up, they can adjust the bond, they can put it up at a different time. Um, but the important thing is, from the takeaway of the presentation, that there are things that are critical. And clearly, clearly, we do not have in our available funds three and a half million dollars to pull out of our savings account to do the middle school roof in an emergency. That would probably, if that happened to the district, just want to be real from a financial perspective, the district would probably have to go out and sell what's called they had to go out and sell a revenue bond, it would certainly have a negative effect on the district's overall credit rate. Because what a revenue bond is, it talks about not having sufficient revenues to fund the needs of the school district. Okay? So, push comes to shove, it's got to get done. So, right. you got you to fund it one way or the other. Once the ship leaves the port with the budget being passed, there, the only way that you can increase the voter approved budget is for the board to approve an emergency and somehow put that money into the budget to uh, accommodate that particular And it would cost us project. more money to do these things out of the budget? We would never save money? We have well, I, you know, I showed you a simple example just on the middle school roof, what the impact of the tax rate would be. So, let's say we missed the boat and we had to go out and do a revenue note we still got to pay back that revenue note. So if it's not in this year's budget, it's going to be in next year's budget, and the taxpayers are going to, they're going to see that tremendous increase. And, and essentially... For how long? Like for one time? Or is it... You know your car's, your car's in bad shape. Right. I'm driving a car 150,000 miles an I know at some point in the near future I'm going to have to buy that car. Right. So what I can do is I can start researching, take out a loan, spread the cost of that car over four or five, six years, right. depending on what car I get. Or I can drive it until it dies. And then, in this case, you have to pay cash out of pocket for the car up front, knowing you might get, you're gonna get aid later on, but you have to spend that money up front. And with a project like the roof, that's beyond our capital reserve, that's unallocated, correct me if I'm wrong, John. Oh, that's correct. So it, it, it's a huge, huge gamble given the infrastructure needs of the district. Yeah, I understand why you put so many things in a bond, but I think that if just the necessity things were in the bond, I think it would people would understand that more for a roof, for a boiler, for things like that. But when I hear for a playground, which I understand the playground over there, however, I've been on plenty of situations where I've fundraised for, for Playgrounds, and we've donated the money to the district, and the district was able to get the proper equipment. I just feel like playgrounds might be a better way to go. You know, just saying, I have children, so I'm, I'm just speaking from the senior's point to see a playground in a bond. I could understand why that, I mean, I'm sure you can understand why that would be a little, you know, not right. Also, I was curious to know. Jerry, can, I just, can I just comment absolutely. on that, just so everybody knows, with the, with the playgrounds? This has been a this has been a real, real challenge over the years. Mm -hmm. um, PTAs used to do whatever they could to fundraise for playgrounds. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, because of some huge liability cases that came out, PTA council decided and issued an edict to their local PTAs that you are not to fundraise for playgrounds. But I thought they were able to fundraise as long as we donated it to the That's district. not what comes out of PTA council. PTA council has taking the position, unless I'm wrong. Um, but I know that last time that we looked at this, PTA Council prohibits their local PTAs for doing active fundraising for playgrounds. I'm not saying if a PTA was in the middle of a fundraiser or they had money for playgrounds, um, is there a way to do it that we're aware of that would shift the liability from the PTA to the school district? Yes, there is. And, and you mentioned that the district would have to accept the donation and do it in a certain way. But still, that doesn't alleviate um, PTA's directive to the local PTAs. So 
getting playground equipment then becomes much more challenging for the district. And quite honestly, the only playground equipment that we have purchased over the years is replacement of things or items that may have been vandalized, sliding ponds, sliding uh, devices, and, you know, little fires and knives, and, you know, things that happen in the community. Uh, question, John. If, if a, a, a local group, not, not, not the TTAs, wanted to fundraising for the playground equipment, the $90,000 collectively, and they raised the $90,000 before we bonded it, they could then donate that $90,000 to the district for the playground equipment. Yes, they could. Um, but I would suggest, I mean... But it, then again, they, they, would, they, they wouldn't get aid on the $90,000. Well, if, if you ask me what would be the easy way to do it, it's easier for an organization to fundraise, buy the piece of equipment themselves, and donate it to the school district. Keep in mind that if we take the money, we, we're subject to the district's purchasing guidelines and requirements. We've got to put it out to bid. We might have to get bonding. We might have to get insurance. It adds to the cost of the project. That's just the way it is doing business with a public school district. So there are ways to do it that fiscally makes sense that it can be done. And just because, I just want to point out again, just because you have the money in the bond and it's earmarked for something, it doesn't mean that you have to spend it. Exactly, that I understand. Right, we can so. donate the money to you. Right, I understand that. Yeah. So if the problem was the PTA, where they were told not to purchase the equipment um, was because of liability let's say I was president and I purchased it and gave it to you, you know, oh, I bought it for the school, I would be liable whether 20 years from now, you know, if someone got hurt. But that's why I understood it as the bylaws as being that we can donate to the district. But I'll check with council and find out, you know. Mr. Bellotti, just, just to clarify, because I'm on council, it's not the council initiative, we just shared it. We were informed by stuff like the New York State PTA that they no longer want them to do it. To even, donate even through to a the district, grant, to donate the about. money to the district. Yeah, okay. I guess there were some lawsuits, so it's really coming from them, and so it's hard, you know, it's hard but to But we wouldn't be, you personally, well, that's no, the I find out the answer, yes. Right. I guess we should get clarification. Absolutely, yeah. because if we could fundraise, I'd rather, like, take that out, and let's, you know. Unfortunately, that's one of the things where liability comes into play. Mm -hmm. And when somebody gets hurt on the playground, right. they not only sue the owner of the property, but they sue the person that supply right, exactly. playroom. So, you know, that's, that's the concern for right. local and, and, you know, something. So you're recommending, well, you, I understand, John, that you're recommending the dollars, not the equipment, donated a, 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 the money instead of having whatever, whatever. But then you can't really promise that you can. Well, I, I think the difference is, John, is, is what I was trying to say. It's easier to accept, for the district to accept the equipment. If, if the PTA can go out and buy a piece of playground equipment, let's say for $20,000, and if the district had to go out and buy that piece of playground equipment, we got to put it out to bid because it's $20,000, okay? If we have somebody installed, they have to pay prevailing wage, okay? The vendor has to provide insurance. The vendor has to provide bonds. That 20000 playground now costs the district 30000 so it's just, it's just a way of doing business. If the organization purchased it and said, we purchased the playground for Sable Schools, would the board accept it? We take a resolution to the board, the board accepts it, we have the piece of equipment. If our guys are eligible to install it, we have it installed. And that I know they won't do because then it's again, then right. that's where we're lying. But no, normally we usually arrange in a situation like that, we have certified installers. I mean, we've gone through that before, so. And the other factor, the reason I consider also discussed. So you have equal facilities in all three elementary schools. Equity. Because, because if we depend on donations, you may get more donations in one school, one school. Oh, I, I'm, yeah. I'm just, yeah. just thinking of a one donation for that particular bottom line. That's what I was about to For the whole thing, not just the Sunrise Evening, Cherry, Middle, whatever. I'm thinking, let's have a fundraiser for one. I was just, that's just a thought. For the rest, of, for the rest of the public, I guess we can see how easy it is to donate something. Well, but then they can, you know, I don't know. Um, also, the air conditioning, I don't know, I came in late, the third floor in this building? Yes. And... It just seems to be on now, by the way. I'm just curious. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> what's on the third 
floor? You're renting, that's going to be rented? The third, third floor is now vacant. Mm -hmm. It's totally renovated. When we renovated this building, we renovated all three floors. And um, we're hoping that as of July 1st, we'll have the entire facility rented. But, ha but you don't think that somebody would rent it Unless it's air conditioned. No, one of the issues, one of the issues that we've had with other organizations, especially when you look at a BOCES, or especially when you look at a college, they can't run their programs here over the summer. Heat rises. Um, if you were to go up there during the summer, it's just it's just so you'd think unbearable. It would be unbearable. Okay. So by air conditioning the space and you know building that cost and coming up with a reasonable rent, market value rent. Um, you, you're capturing the cost of the improvement that you're doing, project becomes aidable. You know, it's just like when we did the renovations in this building. Project was aidable, right. we're getting rent for a number of years, we're entering into a long-term lease. We can honestly say that whatever the net cost was to the taxpayer, we have recouped that in rental payments from Suffolk Community College, and we are in a positive cash flow situation. And you got a building that was built in the early 1900s that looks like this. Valuable, valuable asset. Okay. I, I, I'd rather have the kids have air conditioning in their classrooms than a third floor. Yeah. But I understand, especially the cafeteria. My kids have to work there. But I just, you know, I was just. Well, the cafeteria. I don't, I don't the cafeteria. The cafeteria. It's on there. It's on there. The cafeteria. Well, that's why I would go out and vote for Bond. Of course, without air conditioning, it's only been 20 years now. We have a couple of people. But just thank you, and I'll get back to you. I'll call you and let you know what I find out from the state. Thank you. Please do. Thank you, Carolyn. I had, I'm sorry, I had one over here, and I had a couple in the back. One more. One, one more behind you. Please come up. You. I just have a few actual questions just to get some clarity. So, what do I know I'm creating for this bond? Um, I'm all for the improvements, the roof, the boilers, but my question is. The replacement of those boilers, will that solve the problem in the classrooms where some are 100 degrees and in the winter the classroom windows are open? And in other rooms, there's air conditioning running because we're in the dead of winter and those rooms are extremely hot. And other classrooms are freezing. So, and they're running heaters. So the efficiency committee, for me as a person in this environment, we're kind of environmental in my house, so it's a concern for me where I have a child that I'm sending to school in short sleeve t-shirt because his classroom is so hot that he's having an asthma attack in the dead of winter. So will these boilers save us this issue which is costing us money? I, I yes, I can, um, I'll take a stab at that. Um, I'm going to say yes, that is a significant piece of the issue, but it's not the total answer to the problem. In addition to this capital project, part of what came out of this bond referendum um, study that we did was the upgrade of our univent systems in all of our buildings. We decided to pull that piece out of the bond, and we've decided to do it a different way. We decided to take pieces of it, and over a five-year period, put $800,000 into the general fund budget, okay, a year, and upgrade our univents throughout the district to resolve that exact problem. We're going to be starting in the high school. Um, the plans are already in place. And what that will allow us to do is we will have state-of-the-art um, ventilation systems. And more importantly, they're going to be tied into a building control system where we should be able to regulate the temperature in every room through a computerized system. So that's the advantage by upgrading your technology and going and implementing this new type of technology because it's a cost savings and you could better regulate your heat and your resources in the building. So back on what, what John was saying. So each classroom has these unit ventilators that are built in the same age as the building basically? Yeah, they, they provide heat and ventilation. So they pull in fresh air from the rooms. Now the, these, these ventilator units are ancient. And the problem is getting parts and repairing them has become a cost for him. The nice thing about doing it the way John just proposed is when we put the ventilator units in and we put these new boilers in, you can put a new building management system in, which you just mentioned, which now we're going to be able to digitally monitor and regulate temperatures on a classroom to classroom basis. You can see who's using more energy, who's losing, who's using less energy. 
So from an efficiency perspective, we're actually able to offset some of the energy demand from other projects with this project. But they're not happening in tandem. We're not getting new boilers. One's, so happening, running over, a new one's happening over five years, and one, yes, when the bond passes, or hopefully if the bond passes, will take place at, when we put the boilers. And that becomes the project time. cost. Excuse me? The systems and the technology become a budget line as opposed to a bond. Yes, they're already in, we already have it built into the 2015-16 uh, budget. We've already started. We already started planning with the architect. We're doing the two pieces together for that reason: make sure that we have a complete system, uh, and to make sure that the system is, you know, the latest technology. Okay. Um, you. So the cost of the turf field, the, the whole cost, is inclusive of a fence and protection system to uh, vandalism and blocking those things. My concern would be. Who's going to be using those fields when we're not using them for the school district at night? And will the kids be able to hang out there at night? What my kids play on turf fields, they play travel. So I know the benefits and the not so benefits of the cost of both sides of that. Um, I don't know where I sit on that piece on the bond yet. Yeah, that's why I'm asking these questions. But what protections are in place for that? Is that inclusive of that bond for that turf field to keep the kids from hanging out there locked? And who's just going to be able to use it on the weekends? Like how does that whole system work? Who's, who has the ability to use those fields? Who dictates which sports in our high school play on those fields? Where's that battle get handled? Yeah, as far as our high school sports, all the field sports would be for boys and girls soccer. Boys and girls lacrosse, uh, for field hockey, for football. All the sports would use the, the turf, synthetic turf field. Um, as far as youth groups, the, you need insurance, so it's, it's going, to, going to have to be the, the youth uh, football, lacrosse leagues, soccer leagues that have their insurance policies. And yes, uh, video monitoring and security is part of And who picks between the sports that overlap in high school on that field at a dictated time? They, they will have to be, again, that's why you have lights, so you can have more than one game a day. But and every home game in that sport, whatever, if it's soccer. Because you have sports that overlap seasonally. Right. So who picks? Soccer, football? Soccer, soccer, boys and girls, football and field hockey would have to be scheduled by the athletic director. So their home contests are there and they have certain practice time. It would probably just be varsity, although I'm not sure that would be the athletic director's call. And there would be the J. Well, maybe I could just also, right. if I could tag on to that as well. Um, the Board of Education has a policy, it's a use of facilities policy. It's a process. Every organization has to fill out a form if they want to use the district's facilities. The district has a no trespassing policy as well. So every organization that uses our field, whether it's at the high school, the middle school, one, any one of our elementary schools, they have to have an authorized building permit. Our facilities are patrolled on the weekends, they're patrolled on the evenings. We have a relationship with the Suffolk County Cope officers as well. Um, people that do not have permits to be on the district fields are usually asked to leave. So it is, there is a process, but even though we have that process, the, um, any district function trumps an outside uh, organization using the field. So any one of our teams, whatever the activity, whether it be a practice or a game, uh, we would certainly not allow uh, an outside organization to trump the use of a district team. And that scheduling is all done through the Buildings and Grounds Department. Okay, so then I'm going to re-ask the question then in another way, because I don't have a high school that plays sports yet. So let's for argument's sake say my son is a junior and he plays varsity soccer. And then there's, if I'm assuming correctly, the season is soccer and lacrosse at the same time. Soccer, field hockey, football. Okay, so who dictates football or soccer? They all use it. How is that possible when we're all after school sports at the same they time? They will practice. practice there. They, they would have practice. to 
practice on a rotating basis, but their games would all be there. And the athletic office would handle that schedule. Right. So one sport doesn't supersede another sport. That's correct. I teach in a district that has one turf field um, that is land poor in terms of practice space. We have more practice space than that district does. And I will say they've done a masterful job of making sure that every sport gets to use the field um, in an equitable fashion. So every, every sport would still practice on its dedicated practice field. It's just that in certain game situations or depending on weather conditions, the coaches in every district that I know are amenable and work together because, again, we all realize the value of athletics to our children. To address the security concern, because we're, we're limited to one field, I think the security concern isn't as heavy as if we say had three fields like I slip or Bayshore because we're going to have to use that field and use those lights because of the astronomical, the astronomical growth in youth sports. So between youth soccer and youth lacrosse and you, you know, you, you, whatever sport needs to use it, that field is going to be in use constantly till the evening most nights. So the only time it's going to be not in use would be, you know, say from the hours from 10 at night until 6 in the morning. So because there's such a demand for it, because there's, there really is a need for it, um, I, I think the security concern is. Okay, I want to change that as well. Just a couple more questions. So uh, one, one of the slides from uh, Mr. Valenti showed that it would cost us $96 a year for the bond. And that's a separate amount from the taxes. What are we actually paying on the bonds that we already have that are expiring and this is replacing? So are we paying $50 a year on our bonds and now it's going to $96 or is that $96 added to that amount? Um, well, let me go back to the, the chart. Unless I misunderstood how you presented it. Go back to my chart. Um, basically, when you look at what you're paying now, you're paying at a, an expense level um, that's at four point, just over $4.2 million. Um, what that equates on a tax rate, I didn't count. Right here, John. I'm sorry? So the bond that's outstanding is $4.2 million. The current okay. bond here. Yes. If I go to the mic, I can't use my point. <laughs> Take the mic take with the mic. You can okay. use this one. Okay. So if we if we look at that chart, this is where we are now. If you look at the figures on the bottom, our current debt is four point two million dollars. If you look at sixteen seventeen, the debt drops down to two point one eight. And if you look at where the new bond is, new bond is at three point nine million. So if we were to go to this one, the actual impact the tax rate on the debt service would be less because you're going from 4.2 to 3.9. And again, that's at an estimated 4.2%. So to answer your question, it's a decrease because of this. Okay? This is where you are now, this is where you're going. You're going down, you're not going up. So if the bond is approved in May, when do we see this number? And when does the work start? This would be this would be the bond would be the first payment would be in the 16-17 school year, not 15-16, okay, which is the, the year that we're working on now with the budget. It's going to be the year after. The reason why we're doing all this planning now is to take advantage of this drop in debt service, so it doesn't add an additional burden to where we are. Can I answer that question? I'm sorry. Then the 19.2 million dollars for the bond. It's not all the way to one, it's only done for, for a project. You don't bond the We only have bond with $19.2 million well, it, 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 depends how we, it depends how we lay out the project. In this particular case, because of the debt service, we might bond several times within the 16, 17 school year. But usually we, we phase in the borrower. We want to we want to balance that line out and not be the Yeah, absolutely. Because what we're also trying to do is we're trying to align the debt service with the state aid payments. So that ninety-six dollar figure can actually be lower if it's gradually more than ninety-six dollars. Correct. Based on the rate. Correct. Based on the rate. Based on the rate. But the bond. So the bond. You're initially, and I was 
the banker. So the initial bond, bonds are a fixed rate. So it's based on when you take them out then. So in other words, I was under the impression, and again, my mistake, that you were taking 19.2 million and you were doing all the work. So that, that's exactly why you clarified that. So that would be at a fixed rate. So what you're saying is it, it's a variable and a fixed because it's fixed on the amount when you're taking it. But as a public, it's a variable because it's based on the market and when you go into the bond itself. So if you don't go into the $3.6 million bond until a year where we're in a recession, not what that doesn't happen, again, that rate could, that rate fluctuates. So it's just like a home equity loan. It's whatever you get when what they're offering. So the numbers that you're putting out at a higher rate of 4.25, the current bond rate's a little bit lower, those numbers are not set in stone. They are variable numbers for us as a public and a taxpayer on a bond. Yes, that is an estimated number. But I would just also like to clarify, and I didn't want to turn this into the finance class, but um, it, when bonds are sold at a certain period of time, it does not mean that the rate is fixed. Most of the bonds that we sell, okay, the, the brokerage houses or the agencies that bid on those bonds and buy them, we might have variable rates in those bonds. In other words, we might have five years at 4%. We might have two years at 4.5%. We might have, you know, five years at 3.5%. And then there's what they call, you know, the net effective rate at the bond. So this is, this is our best estimate. And when we, when we look at this from a fiscal standpoint, we really also track the market, okay? So we have a good indication of where bond rates are going. Is it advantageous for us to borrow everything up front and not wait because we know that interest rates are rising? So if interest rates are rising, why would we borrow $10 million and then wait six months when the interest rates rise another percent and borrow the balance of it? doesn't make sense. We would borrow the entire 19 million. So it all really depends on where we are in the point of time and where we think the market's going. And this is not only, you know, this is not only my uh, analysis, but we work with fiscal advisors, we work with bond council, we work with a lot of professionals in the market that, you know, they have a pretty good indication as to where the market might be six months down the road. And then my last question is, the building aid, I, I know somebody asked it, but it was hard for us to hear back there because we were, they were facing this way. If that's set by the state, obviously, is the, the state aid that we get and save the same state aid that Bayport gets? No. Is it, no. So what dictates that? Our bond rating? Uh, the building aid is, is based on a couple of factors. It's based on wealth, it's based on property value, and every district's building aid ratio is different. Districts that have a high wealth ratio, where they have what's called a combined ratio that's well over one, and very little, get very little state aid. There are districts out there that have, they're called flat aid districts, they get hardly any aid whatsoever, okay? We have to be our combined wealth ratio is at just under one this year. We used to be a little over one, one is the state average. Um, some of the printouts I saw of the new state aid formulas have our combined wealth ratio just under one, like 0.96%. So our building aid ratio is based on those factors. Um, it's been this way uh, for many, many years. Do we anticipate this changing? Absolutely not. What the state has done, instead of changing the building aid ratio, they changed the way they pay out building aid years ago. It used to be that when you pay the debt, you got the state aid and you subsequently so if you spend $2 million, you got 68% of $2 million in the next year. Um, that became too costly for New York State. They weren't able to manage that as districts started doing all the infrastructure improvements across the state. So they had to figure out a way to spread it out. So they said, we're going to leave your building aid ratios the same. We're not changing them, but we're going to change the way we pay you that aid. Instead of giving it to you in the subsequent year, we think the life of this project is 15 years. We're going to amortize that aid over 15 years. And we're going to give you a piece of it. And as, as John said, there are, you know, there are districts on the island who are receiving above 68%. Fourth, for example, I understand it's 74%. There's even, there's even some districts upstate New York who are well above 74% who 
I've heard of districts that even 1.25% back in the state. Well, my, the reason I ask that question is because if that number changes, that affects the amount of money when we borrow. So if we're getting less... You hope it goes up. Well, it would be great if it goes up, but if it goes down, then that burden passes back to us again. Correct? Yes. Again, for the last, I know my experience for the last 25, 29 years, the state has never adjusted the district's building aid formula. Once, you know, in districts, they cry very loudly when anything like that is talked about because when you sell a bond and a community commits to a bond, we sell it at a certain rate. How fair would that be to the communities to turn around and say, we're paying you less money? They might figure out ways to make it, make the payments longer, but they're not changing that age ratio. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right here. Thank you. The new guys are there. They said the average lifespan of one of those turf fields is eight to ten years. After that, the field has to be redone again. As the board looked into how much money it's going to cost for that field to be redone again, we're talking a 15-year bond and a turf field that's going to be shot if it gets used as much as Mr. Uh, Pantelosi says. Uh, it's probably going to be not even that state. We're going to have to redo the field again, and then it's going to cost more money. The bond is still going on for 15 years, and we have no, we have a turf field. I'd be able to answer your questions. It's okay. It's okay. And John, correct me, because part of the maintenance amount is putting away, I think it was $20,000 a year over those, putting away $20,000 a year over the 8 to 10 years to have the money to replace the field. It's not the whole field. It's yeah. just the it's it's just just cut. It's the rock. No, it's a cut. It's a grass. I, I heard that, that fabric that's underneath the roofing airport. And of course, if you have a window like you have Again, here, that thing would be down. Part of the maintenance cost, when we figured it out to be zero difference between the uh, grass field and fertilizing and mowing and trying to keep up with the grass field and the turf field, which has very little maintenance have to roll it. Part of the different, that was putting money away, so you have money to replace it after eight or ten years. Well, I, I see your point. Obviously, maintenance life of the field, probably when it's first put in, is minimal at best. But we're talking about a lot of money to put that turf field in. You could buy a lot of fertilizer for quite a number of years to, uh, and, and, and fill whatever it is you have to do on the field. The, the difference is. The difference is that you have one varsity boys cross team playing and one varsity boys soccer team playing on that field, and it's still it's an embarrassment. It's the worst varsity field in Suffolk County. Not to mention, we have we have had home advantage in the playoffs, and Section 11 moved it away from that field. They wouldn't let us play. Now, now with the turf field, we have soccer, boys and girls, football, lacrosse, boys and girls, field hockey, all playing on the field, plus the youth leagues. I tell you, my, my only son played soccer on the field, and everybody that came, everyone had played. Everyone had played. Everyone had played. Everyone had played. Everyone had played.
Um, I think that if we look at the benefits, as you said, is we have 100 homes in foreclosure. I bought in 2008. I moved here, paid too much for a house that wasn't worth it because of the school districts. Because I grew up here, I saw the value in the schools, and I know that this community was committed to education. Um, I'm a product of um, That being said, I'm strapped too. You know, but most of us are strapped in this community. Um, but the value, the asset to the community is the school district. That's what's going to attract new home, home buyers, and that's what's going to keep your home values up. I, I, when I, I drive past Isaac, there's three new fields. I drive past Bayshore, there's three. This field is a necessity for most people. Most people, I shouldn't say it's a necessity. Most people see it as a necessity because we have a health and safety issue. But if we look beyond that, we look at the benefits. It's going to bring in revenue. More people are going to, to attend games. That means local businesses, people are going to spend more money on local businesses. Um, in the long run and in the big picture, it's really going to be a net benefit in terms of, this isn't, this isn't saying, if, you know, I'm not trying to, to say, you know, you should, even if you don't have kids, you should vote. Everyone is in their own situation and we understand that. But even if you don't have children, we personally feel, or I can speak for myself, I feel this is a net benefit to you and to the community. It's at a, it's at a cost and an upfront cost, but in the long term, again, $150 over 15 years, and that's, some people don't have that, I understand that. But in terms of the overall benefit to the community and, and to your home value and, and to maybe your grandkids or, or relatives or people that want to come into the community, it's going to be a positive. Right. I, uh, I have a good time here, folks. No. I will tell you, you know, it, it's going up since I moved in when I had the house in 2000. Yeah. And uh, I think the No, we, I, we, we, leaves, like uh, somebody else mentioned, and I, I find it difficult sometimes to say, okay, there's a certain percentage of people in the town that have children going to school. I did too. I never had any problems. I always voted for the school budget and everything. Never had a problem. My kids got uh, nice education out of here. They went out to college, and, and they both have success in their, in their, in their uh, married life. And uh, I have uh, no problems with you know, it comes a time where things like the middle school roof has got to be done. Yeah. You know, some of these other things and stuff like that. This other thing is kind of iffy. You know? I just want to say one thing also. The original need or want by uh, proposal was $36 million. Through the whole year of going through everything, you know, we evaluated, you know, whether it be the committee or the board, and took things out that we said, yes, they're nice, but, you know, it's not prudent to do that right now. And there were even some in the community that wanted two turf fields, and we said, no, that would be too much to do at this time. But the utilization factor of a turf field will be an asset for the district, and that's why I think it's good. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a gentleman here first, and I have a gentleman here. Do you have any questions? I'm assuming that my taxes are going up every year. Do you want another $100 a year on top of the taxes that are going to go up? this year, and last year, and last year, and last year, for 30 years, and they're just saving me right out of my house, taxing me right out of the house. None of these things do me any good if I have to move. I'm being forced out. I've been building houses in the Sable area for 30 years. You're saving me, you know, no matter how good the deal is, you're saving me right out of my house. And, and get, get a new cafeteria in the Sunrise School when you buy a boiler. We renovated these two buildings. They were supposed to be for the middle school. Now they're being rented out. I have, I have a question over here, then I can get to. It's not so much a question. I think I'm addressing the whole keeping up with the Joneses comment. Um, I think what I, my biggest problem is my daughter plays.
just the way of school districts. It, it, it's just what's going on. And she said it perfectly. It's a dollar a month. The, the, the term field is 13.5% of this bond. $8 a month. That equates to $1 a month. Oh, and I have a gentleman back there. Is it me? Yes. Okay. All right. I only have a few questions that came up. Okay. So you had mentioned about um, okay. you had mentioned um, replacing some of the playground stuff because of vandalism. Don't you have insurance to do that? Yes. Okay, so that's not, yeah. Yes, we have insurance, but okay. most of the time that's not the cover, that's not covered because of deductibles. Okay. We do have a five thousand dollar deductible, so you know, so different pieces of equipment the district is incurring the cost to replace. Okay. Right. That's okay. okay, so you also mentioned the capital fund, which we don't have. How would that how would the establishment of the capital fund benefit us rather than bonding? Um, well, a capital reserve fund is um, just like if you have surplus monies at the end of any particular year, the community could decide that we want to put away X number of dollars a year into a capital reserve fund to use it for specific projects. It then requires voter approval to use that money from a capital reserve fund at a time when there's enough accumulated funds in there to do a particular project. It's another way of uh, accumulating um, monies to do capital projects. Okay, it's usually it's usually something that's over time. But once again, um, for instance, if you decided that you wanted to put half a million dollars in the budget to um, to fund a capital reserve fund, that half a million dollars has to go into the budget, and it's going to raise the budget by at least one percentage point, or just under one percentage point. Okay. So, and then over the years, you accumulate. So basically, it would not be cheaper to have one of these funds to do projects that you go around rather than carrying out. No, money. because you have to, the taxpayers, you have to specifically budget the money. You have to explain that to the taxpayers during the budget development process. And, um, and the voters have to vote on it. Okay. Um, my other comments, well, there's, there's a few things on there, but, um, you know, the 68% that they're that Golden is giving us, still our tax dollars, so we're paying for this either way, right? I mean, I'm not wrong, it's not a gift. Yeah, spread right? out. Well, it's spread out. It's our tax dollars coming up for that to us. So I just want to make sure I wasn't. Yeah, but if I could just point something out on that point, it's a, I think it's important to note that Long Island sends up 70% of the New York State revenue and we only get back 12. Right. So if the state is giving you 68% of your building aid, we're funding, we're funding the monies for the rest of the state. Right. So if we have that advantage, it's a good thing. Okay, all right. Um, let's see, so based on your bar chart for the chart, so we're never really gonna be out of debt, right? The next well, that's not true. Well, no, I mean, I'm just I'm trying to get it through my head because I, I totally get it. You know, you refinance your house, you do some projects, the rates go down, you refinance again, you do something else. But you're always still owing on your house. So I'm trying to see, like, the blue, the blue line? I can't see. So the yeah, blue line is all the way down to zero, way out there. Right. Right, that's if you do nothing. If you did nothing else, okay. you didn't bond anything else, Okay. you, you hit zero in the year. 2030. 2030. Okay, so but we're still, you know, we're still just going to be in debt. Right. 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 Uh, usually the infrastructure you're talking about is conduits, the lines, usually you don't have problems with those type of things. Okay. Um, but in the event yeah, you, did, you did have an issue, you have to take care of it. Um, it's very different if you have to open up a section or a piece of something, then rip up half of the 
turf field to get a conduit across to the other side. But that's still going to happen. Excuse me? That, that's still going to happen for repair, so you're going to have to repair your conduit rather than something happens. Let's hope the architecture doesn't yeah. I think a big problem, um, I don't know if it's a residual from last year or not, is trust in the process. Um, if we look at the last two bonds, again, that came in under budget, and we were actually able to do more than we initially planned to bond, and you look at our bond rating from Moody's, the projects in the past have been managed well. Not that you don't want to plan for contingencies, not that, listen, things could go wrong, but again, we're working with an architecture firm that we've had a relationship with for, for a very long time. Um, when you look across the island at these projects, these things are not happening, in a, they're not happening on a large scale. So again, I think it's good to, to talk about, okay, maybe what if, but I fear that that might tend to dominate the conversation and, and the reality is very different from what it is. Well, I work in the state and we currently got a big load oh, of, no, the state of, is a, of steel from China. Yeah, so, no, I'm, I'm trying, I'm just focusing on, I'm trying to focus on the... Right, gotcha. Okay, um, my other question as far as uh, the, um, you're renting out the third floor here? Thank you. 